Several days have passed since I sent a letter to Matt Sibson of the Ancient Architects channel in which I asked him. Matt, how did it come about that the plot of your film precisely mirrored that of my own, released a week earlier on my Russian language channel? If we both arrived at the same conclusions simultaneously, that's great. It means we think alike and have something to discuss. But Matt has not responded to my letter. At least because he doesn't owe me a response. Perhaps Matt didn't respond also because it is not in his plan to debunk the fabricated official history of the megaliths, including those of the Peruvian fortress of Sacsayhuaman. This September, he is organizing an exclusive tour to Giza where his group will be granted access to certain parts of the Great Pyramids that are closed off to regular tourists. And if Matt were to tell his viewers that there is no mystery of the Egyptian pyramids, as I have done, please subscribe to my channel. And that they are merely limestone hills, clad less than 400 years ago with limestone blocks sourced from these same limestone hills, then not only would Matt likely be denied access to the closed sections of the pyramids, but perhaps Egypt would become a closed country for him. Because the invented riddles of the Egyptian pyramids can be sold for centuries to gullible tourists, and the real true story of the creation of these pyramids is worth nothing. This also applies to the enigmatic stones of Sacsayhuaman, which aren't so enigmatic at all if you look at the history of their creation not from the standpoint of wonders and puzzles, but from the perspective of the interests of different groups of people and the means available to them to realize their corporate interests. For instance, there's only one professional group of people who due to the nature of their work, have been in Peru, Egypt, and Japan, and left behind such mysterious artifacts. Yes, in Japan, there is also polygonal masonry, exactly like that of the Peruvian Incas historians couldn't age the stone masonry of Edo Castle in Tokyo back several centuries, as they managed to do with the copy, or the original, of this masonry in Peru. The construction of Edo Castle is dated to the 17th century. So, the previous film was about the polygonal masonry of the Peruvian Indians, the main mystery of which is not how these huge limestone rocks were moved from the quarry to the construction site, no one ever moved them from place to place, but the fact that geochemical analysis of these stones showed their artificial origin. This conclusion was made on the basis that the stones in the masonry are recrystallized and do not contain traces of organic remains, unlike samples of limestone from the presumed quarry. See all the details in the previous film. You can find the link to the report by the candidate of Geological and Mineralogical Sciences, Viktor Nikolaevich Burdnikov, below in the description. So, the main secret of Sacsayhuaman is not how these stones were mysteriously transported from the quarry to their location, I reiterate, nobody lifted or moved them, but rather, their artificial origin. And if this mystery is revealed and we explain how these stones were formed from naturally sourced construction limestone then the flow of tourists to this stone garden and other similar so-called pre-Columbian structures would decrease significantly. I would advise the operators of this attraction, who sell tickets to an ancient highly advanced civilization, to not show anyone these stones. It can be easily understood from them that they had not fully hardened when another layer of similar plasticine, in quotes, stones was placed on top. And now, knowing that these stones were molded on site, worked on with tools like a spatula, it's high time we find out who needed this cryptic structure, which historians call the Fortress of Sacsayhuaman. It should be noted that the term fortress in relation to this stone garden is purely nominal, and many researchers believe that Sacsayhuaman is not a fortress, but rather, it's an exclusively ritualistic place for conducting various Inca festivals and ceremonies. To answer the question of who and why built this stone garden, we first need to gather information about the city of Cusco itself, which historians call the pre-Columbian capital of the Inca Empire. Historians, unaccustomed to the site through European eyes, noticed the polygonal masonry in the streets of Cusco and quickly declared it an artifact of an ancient pre-Columbian civilization. But the fact is, the Native Americans of both South and North America, before the arrival of the Europeans, didn't know what metallurgy was, they had neither iron nor bronze tools, and therefore, they didn't have the means to erect such construction projects. Thus, it doesn't really matter if the masonry is polygonal or regular stone masonry, this is already the Iron Age, which in America began with the arrival of Europeans. As a result of such a distorted history, the Inca roads, leading both to the Inca temples and to the European silver mines, had to be named pre-Columbian pedestrian roads of the Incas since the Incas, and indeed all Native Americans of both continents, didn't have draft animals capable of pulling a wheeled cart. 
So, Native Americans didn't know the wheel, and not because they were less intelligent than Europeans. Without draft animals, there is no wheel, and without a wheel, there's no point in building roads which would prevent a wagon's wheels from sinking into the ground. Even more so, there's no sense in building such roads solely for pedestrians between cities, especially in mountainous terrain. The Great Silk Road managed just fine without roads, as pack animals don't need roads. Roads are needed only for wheels. Nowhere in the world were roads between cities built only for pedestrians. But due to the distorted history of Latin America, this nonsense about pre-Columbian thousands of kilometers long sidewalks across all of South America has ended up in history textbooks and reference books. Just listen to this nonsense. The use of the Inca roads in the colonial period after the Spanish conquest of Peru was mostly discontinued. The conquistadors used the Inca roads to approach the capital city of Cusco, but they used horses and ox carts, which were not usable on such a road, and soon most of the roads were abandoned. This is what I call a mockery of common sense and nothing else. Yes, these roads were indeed built by Native Americans, but under the guidance and in the interests of the Europeans, since the European civilization of that time was unthinkable without roads for draft transport, as well as bridges, viaducts, and other road infrastructure. The Europeans transferred their construction technologies to the colonies, including the roads that are now called Roman roads. This is an old Roman road in Crimea. But to be precise, this road was built by the Genoese in the 15th century when they had a trading factory in Crimea. The so-called Roman roads were no different from Inca roads until historians, especially for tourists, removed the upper layer of soil along with the turf. Horses fertilized the Roman stone roads with manure so the hooves of horses and wagon wheels touched not the stones, but the dense turf. Under the turf, there was another thick layer of soil that leveled out all irregularities. A wagon traveled on such a road as if on a carpet. Check out my previous films where I explain in more detail how parts of Latin American history and artifacts were cut out from the 16th and 17th centuries and moved into the pre-Columbian era invented by historians. It should be added here that the Christianization of the Native Americans of Latin America has not been completed to this day. On the surface, Native Americans appear to be Christians, attending the temples of the Catholic Church. But inside these temples, they place icons of their traditional Native American deities under the guise of Native American saints. Native Americans of both Americas built their idolatrous temples right in the center of Latin American cities up until the 18th century. The Incas also built their non-Christian temples both in Cusco itself and near the city, with the full indulgence of the church authorities. This is what the interior of an Inca temple looked like in the early 18th century, built according to European architectural canons. The Roman church turned a blind eye to this because in the 16th and 17th centuries, the Roman church needed not the souls and hearts of the Native Americans, but the gold and silver of Mexico and Peru, from those same Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas to whom historians in the 18th to 19th centuries invented pre-Columbian civilizations, so as not to associate the Christian Catholic Church with these obscene pagan temples. Before it was decided to rewrite the history of Latin America to please the Roman Catholic Church, these pagan temples fit quite well into the concept of exploiting the wealth of the New World. After the Dominicans, the Franciscans were the most influential monastic order of the Roman Catholic Church. They specialized in studying the culture, customs, and dialects of the local people, communicating directly with the indigenous inhabitants without the need for a translator. The second, if not the main, specialization of this order was the construction of buildings, structures, and road infrastructure. The Franciscans were also the best builders of aqueducts. Yes, those same Roman aqueducts of the 15th to 17th centuries, which historians moved back by one and a half thousand years. The Franciscans built exactly the same Roman aqueducts in Latin America. This aqueduct is in Mexico City. In 2009, a glossy publication titled Journey Through the History of Mexico was released in Mexico City. This publication had a print run of 25 million copies and involved the participation of the Ministry of Public Education, the National Commission for Free Textbooks, and the National Institute of Anthropology and History of Mexico. You will find a link to this document in the description below. We read the section on evangelization. In 1524, a group of 12 Franciscan monks arrived in New Spain, soon followed by the Dominicans and Augustinians. 
By 1540, there were over a hundred missionaries scattered across all conquered territories. Each monk, upon arrival, set two tasks for himself, studying one or several of the indigenous languages and the local customs related to worshipping ancient gods. The main task of the missionaries was to introduce the Christian faith among the pagans through preaching. Their work did not stop there. Now pay attention. They gathered the indigenous people into new villages, built monasteries, chapels, and churches, as well as roads, bridges, and aqueducts, hospitals, schools, and so on. I deliberately quoted such a long passage for those who still doubt that in the past monks were involved not only in religious matters but also secular ones, which were also in the interest of the church. The chief architect of Yucatan in the mid-16th century was Franciscan friar Juan de Merida. Merida is the capital of Yucatan. He is credited with building almost all Franciscan monasteries on the peninsula. Here's what is written about him in the History of Yucatan, published in 1688. This blessed religious man taught many the art of masonry and stone carving, and he organized everything so that the work was completed relatively quickly. Since this land was so rich with Indians and their hearts were imbued with divine grace, everything seemed easier for the celestial servants. The text clearly states that this Franciscan monk taught the indigenous people how to work with stone and build structures from it. Now guess who organized the silver mining in Latin America, and consequently, who owned the mine silver of Mexico and Peru, the Spanish kings, or the Roman church? There's a hint in the 13th film, where I talk about how French scientists didn't find silver in the Spanish coins of the 16th and 17th centuries, even though they were supposed to be sourced from Potosí, the world's largest silver mine at the time. However, this silver from Mexico and Peru is present in Roman coins, which is yet another solid proof that the names, events, and artifacts of the 15th to 17th centuries were deliberately moved to the invented on paper antiquity in the so-called Roman Empire. The topic of Franciscans and the silver mines of America is tabooed and deeply hidden in the Vatican archives. And in our perception, all Catholic monks are penniless whose life purpose lies in apostolic poverty, asceticism, and love for their neighbor. Nevertheless, some information has indeed made its way into the public domain. Many sources reported on the reopening of a silver mine in Texas. I will quote one of them. State history records show the Spanish prospected the area in the 1600s and Franciscan friars operated silver mines near El Paso about 1680. Another source comes from the Cambridge University publication, the America Journal's third issue from 1947, about Franciscan monks in Mexico and what they were doing there. In the Panuco province, on the eastern edge of the Gran Chichimeca, one of the greatest of the Franciscan, Andres de Olmos, began his apostolate also in the 1530s. Besides his many intellectual achievements, Father Olmos was, for decades, one of the principal Spanish bulwarks against the Chichimeca raids from the eastern Sierras. His importance in this area, and especially his influence with the natives, undoubtedly accounts for the fact that he was commissioned by the Viceroy to open a trade route from the Gulf of Mexico to the silver mines of the interior, in 1569-1570. Further down the same page. With the momentous expedition which discovered silver at Zacatecas in 1546, went four Franciscans. They were not the last of the friars to participate in significant mineral discoveries on the far frontier. Some of the great mines became known to the Spaniards as a result of the friars' influence on recent converts. And a footnote at the bottom under number 26. An example of this is the Franciscan participation in the discovery of the San Luis Potosi mines in the early 1590s described in Velázquez. End of citation. San Luis Potosi is a city in Mexico, named after the Peruvian city of Potosi. And of course, in the Peruvian Potosi, the same pattern was observed, a Franciscan monastery stood and still stands at the city center, which organized the extraction and processing of silver ore into ingots at the world's largest silver mine. It is better for simple believers not to know what the monks of the Roman Church were doing in America and on other continents. Their spiritual mission was only part of the societal work they engaged in. I'll read a fragment from a source dating back to 1866. Immediately after the completion of the conquest of Mexico, the soldiers and settlers divided the lands among themselves, founded settlements and created municipalities, establishing the rules and regulations that they saw fit. Almost immediately after the creation of these municipalities, they refused to recognize the authority of Hernán Cortés and the government of Spain. 
The prudent Cortes turned for protection to the Franciscan friars, who already had considerable influence among the whites and among the Indians. Thanks to the protection of the monks and the help of the Indians, the conqueror of Mexico was able to obtain obedience from those who had previously been his subordinates, but got out of his control. When judges appointed by the metropolitan government subsequently arrived to try Cortes, the monks were able to prevent the blow and advised their ward to go to Spain to personally defend themselves. They gave him letters of recommendation with which he was very well received at the king's court. Indian encomiendas were also established in Peru, but even then the church had more influence and used it with more success, if possible, than in Mexico. The monks constantly opposed the projects of the colonists, who sought to freely dispose of the Indians. So, the Franciscan monks had a great influence on the colonists, on Cortes, on the king, and on the indigenous people they took under their protection. Moreover, the Franciscans constructed roads, bridges, aqueducts, and managed silver mines. By the way, the 16th century Mexican aqueduct, the aqueduct of Padre Temblic, is named after the Franciscan monk who oversaw its construction, mainly by local indigenous people. Workers were needed everywhere, who first had to be prepared, taught at least elementary skills, and only then could they be sent to construction sites, mines, and or mines. And who better than the Franciscan monks, who could communicate with the indigenous people without an interpreter and were the best builders of their era, could have prepared the indigenous people to work on construction sites and in silver mines? From a logistics point of view, Cusco, this city was at the center of roads leading to silver mines, was the best place for gathering and the initial stage of preparing miners for silver mines, many were needed a lot. Historians call Cusco the capital of the Inca Empire because Cusco was at the center of the empire and from it spread for so-called Inca roads in different directions. Only all these supposedly pre-Columbian indigenous roads led directly to the European silver mines, as well as to seaports built by Europeans for the export of gold and silver to Europe and Asia. Young indigenous people arrived in Cusco, where they were taught the basics of working in a team. Under the guidance of mentor monks, they transported not yet petrified natural limestone from the Rotadero formation, from which they molded these stones. Yes, they molded them, because some stones, especially the largest ones, contain foreign pieces of rock inside them. Something akin to ballast. The interior stones on one hand reinforced the entire molded structure, and on the other, they served as an internal formwork, which helped this large molding maintain its shape until it completely hardened. Such construction projects had no practical sense, except for one thing, through this, the indigenous people were gaining elementary construction skills. It's quite possible that their shamans told the indigenous people they were building yet another indigenous pagan temple. However, in reality, their labor was nothing more than a preparation for more complex construction work, for work in the quarry, in the mine, and so on. By the way, chemically, the stones of Sacsayhuaman are very similar to Roman cement, which consisted of two-thirds lime and one-third volcanic ash. The volcanic formation of Rotadero near Sacsayhuaman is actually limestone, with volcanic emissions penetrating it, including volcanic ash and diorite. For a more detailed account of how limestone mixed with volcanic emissions to create the Rotadero formation, see my previous film. So, as soon as the monk mentor noticed that the entire group of indigenous people was ready for further training at their permanent workplace, the group was dispatched to construct Andean road infrastructure or to the mines and quarries. And then this place became purely ritualistic. In the literal sense of the word, the souls of the indigenous people who died in the mines of South America are left in these stones. In the Bolivian city of Potosí, BBC report from 2014, a mass grave was discovered, containing no less than 400 individuals. The remains are believed to belong to miners from the colonial era. The grave was found by workers conducting excavations for the construction of a new building. The mine in Potosí became the largest in the world after the Spanish discovered silver there in 1545. African and indigenous slaves worked in the mines. It's estimated that up to 8 million people perished. Can you imagine? 8 million people died in just one mine, albeit once the largest mine in the world. The history of the exploration of America is filled with mysteries and secrets, the veil over which is gradually lifting for the inquisitive researcher. In the next film, we'll discuss the enigmatic Machu Picchu and the polygonal masonry of Edo Castle, built in the 17th century.
Could it be that both the Peruvian Machu Picchu and the Japanese Edo Castle were also the work of the Franciscans? Yes, they were indeed the handiwork of the Franciscans. My book, The Other History of Roman Empire, is for those who not only want to know history, events, dates, and names, but also to understand its cause and effect relationships. That's all from me, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this film. Your interest and curiosity are what drives us to keep uncovering the intricate layers of our shared history. Stay inquisitive, and until our paths cross again, take care, I wish you all the best and look forward to our next encounters. This has been Alexander Tomansky.